I was angry the first time I watched this documentary going clear. I wrote something on Facebook, and people still ask me about that post, and they still ask me what's new in the world of Scientology. It, because something's got to be done, hun. These guys are still in business, and for the life of me, it just chaps my ass to no end. As if anybody needed even more reasons to love this guy, Mike Rowe. Hey everyone, AA Ron here, and welcome back to the channel. We're talking about Mike Rowe from the TV show Dirty Jobs. This guy is so likable. He is so relatable. His TV show Dirty Jobs isn't on the air anymore. He's had one or two other shows since then. He also has a podcast called The Way I Heard It with Mike Rowe. And I'm gonna guess that most people, even people who are already fans of Mike Rowe, have no idea just quite how hard Mike has come out publicly against Scientology. In March of this year, Mike did an episode of his podcast titled The Crushing Certainty of Scientology, and he interviewed a woman who used to work for him named Spanky Taylor. Spanky was one of the former Scientologists, former Sea Org members actually, who was featured most prominently in the devastating HBO documentary by Alex Gibney called Going Clear. The documentary was based on the book by Lawrence Wright, also called Going Clear. Mike was already close friends with Spanky when that documentary came out. In fact, he'd hired Spanky to work for him. So Spanky's got a business in Hollywood. She handles correspondence for celebrities. And I'm talking like A list celebrities. It's her business. It's what she does. And when Going Clear came out in 2015, she'd already had a long professional relationship and a personal friendship with Mike. So he brought Spanky onto his podcast. They talked about uh, the horrors of her experience in Scientology. But he begins the interview by making a callback to something he posted online back when Going Clear came out. So this was April 2015. We're talking over seven years ago. This is even before Scientology in the aftermath. I want to share with you what Mike posted. Mike said, when I was shooting Dirty Jobs, I hired a woman named Spanky Taylor to help me fulfill requests from viewers and fans. If you've ever asked for and received from me an autographed photo or a signed letter for an Eagle Scout, it was Spanky who licked the stamp and got it in the mail many thousands of times. Anyway, I just finished watching a documentary on HBO in which Spanky appears. That's her behind me on my unnecessarily large TV screen. The documentary is called Going Clear, and while it's not exactly an Easter story, it's most definitely a tale of resurrection and new life. I'm posting this today because I think everyone who has ever been lied to or deceived should watch it. Going Clear, among other things, tells the story of Spanky Taylor's escape from the Church of Scientology. Like all church employees, Spanky signed a billion-year contract and pledged her life to the cause. She was, according to her own account, brainwashed, programmed, and forbidden from leaving the property. When she gave birth, her baby was put in a separate location so as not to interfere with her church duties. One day, Spanky went to visit her daughter. The baby was malnourished and utterly neglected. She was covered with flies. Her eyes were filled with pus and fused shut. Something finally snapped, and with the help of a friend, and Spanky took her child, fled from her captors, and never looked back. I knew Spanky's story when I hired her. So when I watched her tale unfold on my unnecessarily large screen, I was not struck by the details of her personal ordeal or by the incredible stories of the other members who broke free and agreed to come forward. In truth, I'm no longer shocked by people who choose to follow a charlatan or give away all their money or forsake their friends and family to seek some greater truth or drink whatever Kool-Aid is being served. The right to make bad decisions is an important part of being free. And to be clear, as it were, I don't begrudge Scientology's right to exist or the right to separate a fool from his or her money in whatever legal means possible. Caveat emptor. But beyond all that, the thing that really chaps my ass is the fact that our government has enabled Scientology to grow into the colossus it's now become. In 1993, the IRS granted tax-exempt status to Scientology. This ruling not only saved Scientology many millions of dollars, it gave them status as a worldwide religion and dramatically increased their power to recruit more members or customers if you prefer. That changed everything. The financial facts are beyond dispute. Scientology is a multi-billion dollar business that sells a tangible service called auditing. They also create auditors for a price. Prior to 1993, an auditing session was no different from a tax standpoint than a session with a palm reader, a fortune teller, a hypnotist, or a voodoo priestess. It was a taxable event. That's no longer the case. Today, the Church of Scientology generates billions of dollars in revenue and pays no tax at all, zero. Maybe I'm still a little cranky from the check I just wrote to Uncle Sam. Hell, maybe I should write a book and turn Mike Rowe works into a religion. Or maybe not. Either way, for all sorts of reasons, going clear made me angry. And if you're offended by bullies and opportunists who take advantage of people at their most vulnerable and an IRS that seems both craven and manipulable, then it'll make you angry too. But mostly, Going Clear made me very proud of my friend and others like her. It's a hell of a thing to realize everything you believe is not what you thought it was, and even harder to confess your mistakes to the world and start over. 
Paul Haggis, a talented and successful screenwriter, comes forward, along with a handful of former members and church officials who endured the kind of threats and intimidation that would keep most people silent. Their courage is impressive. Going Clear is not a blockbuster. It does have star power, though, and more than its share of heroes and villains, some of whom you'll certainly recognize. Check it out. Happy Easter, Mike. Oh, it's an Easter post. Okay, that's why he mentioned Easter in the beginning. That is a powerful, powerful thing for a guy who works in Hollywood to come out and post online. And, you know, speaking of working in Hollywood, like you could say the same thing for Spanky. Even though she lives in the Los Angeles area, works in Hollywood, if Scientology was dedicated to destroying her, they certainly could. So doing that in Spanky's industry, living where she does, uh, that takes courage. So that's true for Spanky, and it's certainly true for Mike Rowe, who one could argue has even more to lose by putting a target on his back. So Mike posted this 10 minute clip from the podcast onto his YouTube channel. So let's check it out. You know, we like to count down from six just to build the drama, Spanky. A lot of people go from three. Occasionally you'll hear five, but Chuck likes to start with the number six. So there are like a gajillion things we can talk about, but sure. I know Chuck told you that um, I was angry the first time I watched this documentary going clear. I was also inspired. I thought it was just incredibly brave. You know, and I wrote something on Facebook Easter about seven years ago. And people still ask me about that post and they still ask me what's new in the world of Scientology. It really reached a lot of people. I just watched the movie again. And that's why I called Chuck. I said, look, we, I want to talk to Spanky. I want to talk about this movie. And I just think it's important for people to understand why the movie was made, why you agreed to be in it. Because something's got to be done, hon. These guys are still in business, and for the life of me, it just chaps my ass to no end. They still have tax exempt status, so we That's are the all worst. paying for them to exist and to do the nasty things they do to their former members. And, um, and they get away with it completely because they're a church, or so they call themselves. But the thing that interests me most about your story and everybody who was in this documentary is the frog in the boiling water. Yeah, it's the truly. way, it's the way it creeps up on us. You so know? insidious. I would love for you just to give us the sort of the short version if such a thing exists about how they got you, how they kept you and how you got out. Well, I was very young when I got interested because it was friends who introduced me to it. Friends who I had great regard for. They got involved. I was really young, 13, 14 years old. The peer pressure got to me, I think, and they sold me this bill of goods, of course. They were duped as well as I was, but, and which they've, they've since then, most of them have departed the group as well, which I'm so grateful for. I just followed them in and, and bought into it completely and trusted. At, at the beginning, you question everything and you go, well, this doesn't make any sense. But in very short order, something called thought stopping techniques come into play where you, you, you start to question, you go, this is, this is messed up. Oh no, I must have counterintention. Oh, I must be connected to somebody that's bad, who's against me getting better, which is called a suppressive person yes. perhaps. Yeah. Yes. Or yes. Or a potential trouble source. So there's always a reason. So it always cracks me up when non-Scientologists use the Scientology language. I love it. You assign all your doubts to something else and, and, and then you just shut those thoughts off. You just stop thinking. And, um, and they're called thought stopping techniques, which the organization is really good at using. And, mm -hmm. um, and I did that for years. What were they selling that you found appealing? Well, was I, wasn't, I wasn't in it because I wanted my own gain. I wanted to help people. I mean, I, you know, I was child in the 60s for the most part. I mean, um, so, you know, I was tuned in, turn on, drop out era. People's Park was happening in Berkeley. And I, I just wanted to help people so much. And, you know, I, tr you know, was active trying to stop the war and all that stuff that I think, in large part, we did. I mean, I think that public discontent and a mass scale all over the country at the same time made a big difference. But I really want to make a huge difference. And I felt when these guys said, look, we can do it, but we have to help people one by one. We have to clear the planet. We have to help each individual go clear and get rid of their reactive mind, which is this 
thing that they claim exists, which, by the way, does not. And they you later find out, even in Scientology, it doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, it's something I just want to highlight here is that this is why most Scientologists to a person on uh, individually we're talking about are good people motivated by good intentions. People get into Scientology due to a sincere desire of wanting to help and thinking that Scientology is that path. Uh, and people ask me a lot, like, was there ever anything good in Scientology? And um, the thing is, if, if Scientology was all bad all the time right from the beginning, then nobody would ever join. You have to think about it that way. At the early, early levels, Scientology is more or less like a self-help, self-improvement, you know, kind of motivational, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, here are some tools you can use to make your life better kind of thing. And that is what appeals to people at the introductory levels. And I think when you hear people's stories about Scientology, this will be a very consistent theme. They all had good motives for getting in and there was something at the introductory levels that resonated with them and made them want to stick around or find out more. All right, let's keep going. So it's just ridiculousness. You know, when you look at the documentary and you, and you talk to people, and just kind of skipping ahead, you learn about Xenu and you sure. learn about Phaetons and you look, it's just comic book stuff. And no one in their right mind would look at that and go, oh, okay, that tracks. But to <laughs> my earlier point. They tell you the beginning, Mike. They say, oh, <laughs> this is going to help you so much get along better with your girlfriend, your wife, your parents. This will help you in the workplace. We're just going to teach you to communicate. You, so you're not buying into all that. It, nobody, I don't think, in their right mind would go, oh, Oh, okay, Zeno, okay, sign me up. Nobody does that. But Hubbard, in time, the whole process creates such um, credibility for him that soon you don't question anything. How much money do you reckon you paid over the years? I in didn't the course pay. Of being I, I was a slave. I signed a billion-year contract, as you might recall. And from the time I was very young, I worked for nothing, for slave wages. But I sometimes really, in all fairness, I got as much as $15 a week. And, you know, oh, that's 18, 20 hours a day. And what were you doing? Well, I was doing whatever they told me to do. Sometimes I was doing promotion for events. Sometimes I was doing, um, when I was in the slave labor camps, I was putting up drywall and, and working physical labor. But mostly I was just doing organizational stuff and recruiting people and keeping them happy and involved. And you remember from the film, I was John Travolta's quote handler for many years. Why? What, what was your relationship with John prior to that? I met him in the organization. I, at the time I worked for this woman, Yvonne, and I was her public relations officer. She was a representative for Hubbard and the head of Celebrity Center. So my job was to make sure he was happy and got what he needed and made sure that he stayed pleased. Hmm. I mean, the power of celebrity for an organization like that is is huge. Honey, and it's their endorsement arm, whether it's Gucci or whatever, they have a spokesperson and a celebrity endorsement. These people, you just recruit these people and then they become your endorsement arm. I remember. By the way, um, Spanky's relationship with John Travolta is, is central and, and pivotal to her story of being in the Sea Org, the abuse she experienced in the Sea Org, her effort to get out of the Sea Org. Spanky and John were very close and John could have very easily gotten Spanky out of any trouble that she was in. And they're, they're, this part of going clear is really heartbreaking. I remember an interview with Travolta where he started going to Scientology and that guy booked everything, everything he touched. And you're right, that's about the best PR you can get for an actor to tell other actors that I was struggling, then I went here, started getting audited, and now I'm in commercials, now I'm in sitcoms. The guy was on fire. Except, Mike, the truth of them, I mean, in my humble opinion, John Travolta was always incredible. And he was booking stuff before he came along. That's that's what our reaction, you know, our attraction to him was he was... He had it. He really had the it factor. And he was booking whatever he went for, he booked he, band aids commercial. This is before Scientology. Everything he went up for, he booked. And then he got in Scientology and then he books a TV series. Well, hello. He probably would have anyway because he just was that good at what he did. And he was funny and he was he was kind and charismatic and wonderful at what he did and had this magic that he came in with. So to attribute all that to the organization, that's giving them all a power that he already possessed. But unbeknownst to him, he didn't realize he had it already. I wonder if he even believed in himself at that time. But it was pretty obvious he was 
pretty magnificent. You guys became close. He was at your wedding, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And he cared for you, and you cared for him. Very and, much. But, but he I, must have known you're you're basically part of the cheapest workforce since slavery, and you are living in conditions that aren't great. I don't think they think about that. I don't think they really look at that. He, ne- I don't think he ever came to see where we lived. I don't recall him ever coming there. You know, we lived in a pretty squalorly situation back then. I think it's the situation has changed considerably because now they make more money too. They make like fifty dollars a week versus fifteen dollars a week or something like that. I don't know what they make now. <laughs> it's true. Sea Org members working for Scientology. They have been making fifty dollars a week for over. 25 years. They don't even get an inflation or cost of living increase. I mean, because this $50, it's not actually considered pay or salary, although it is taxed. I remember um, we would get FICA taken out, Social Security, and even some federal income tax for some reason. It's not considered wages, even though they are taxing it as if it's wages. It's considered an allowance. In other words, Sea Org members sometimes have their pay completely cut. So when I say they get $50, I mean, that's the maximum. Maximum is $50 a week. And they've been getting that for over 25 years without any increase. And with that $50, they actually have to purchase hygiene supplies. The Church of Scientology does not provide its Sea Org members with soap, toothbrushes, shampoo, anything. So even though the living conditions for Sea Org members have improved because Scientology makes more money and the quality of the birthing or the apartments where they live has improved, they are still, by any normal usage of the word, slave labor. These people don't have the freedom to travel. They don't have freedom of movement. They can't even afford to leave if they wanted to. And that is where the Aftermath Foundation comes in, by the way. The Aftermath Foundation exists to help people who are in the Sea Org escape from the Sea Org if they want to, even if they have no money, no family, no friends, and no place to go. And when you have to create a foundation to provide resources to members of a group who want to escape, that ought to tell you just about everything you need to know about that group. Okay, let's see what else they discuss. Explain what Sea Org is, if you would. The Sea Organization is the most fraternal part of the organization, and it's where the well, they claim the most dedicated members are, I consider the most brainwashed members are, other than the public who are paying money for this. You sign a billion-year contract. You agree to do any job at any time. Whether you're trained or untrained, you have to do it because Hubbard claimed you've done everything in your existence of the trillions of years of your existence. So, okay, I want you to do brain surgery now. Well, you better just remember how you did it before. Or, I mean, I'm being, I'm exaggerating there, but I mean, it's kind of almost that outrageous. That you, but you're you not exaggerating it? about the billion years. It no. literally says. It literally is a billion, contract, billion years. Yeah. years. Yes, and I broke my contract. So. so. I mean, is Only it, by about 999,999,000 million, <laughs> nine yeah, years. Quitter, and it's a blessing that I did because otherwise I wouldn't have a life if my children would have had life. But it was truly, it was my children who saved my life there, honey, because Mike, I, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't do, I couldn't keep them there. I couldn't do it. It was too awful. And I had, uh, you know, I worried about my kids. And so my daughter, I, I kidnapped her and escaped out. My, I was pregnant with my son who was, I was in the prison camps when I was pregnant. So he was born quite ill under, he was full term and under three pounds. And, Mm. um, I, I just had, I had not gotten out. I don't know what would have come of anything. I just can't imagine. Wow. Just incredible to me. Always incredible to me when I see someone in the industry have the balls, not just to crack a Scientology joke here and there, but actually shine a spotlight on the Scientology abuse, on the unbelievable uh, exploitation and manipulation uh, that this group exerts over its members. And again, as if we needed any more reasons to love Micro. If you'd like to see or listen to the whole thing, go to micro.com slash podcast. I, I imagine you can see this thing absolutely anywhere where you, you already listen. Whatever podcast you already listen to, check this one out as well. All right, everyone, that is all I've got. Thank you for watching. Thank you to all of you who watch until the very end, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see an, a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe right here. Bye!